from all over the world, but I wanted to welcome everyone to today's YouTube Live. This is our second YouTube Live, and we really loved the experience so much. We're going to continue doing this. It's a pretty easy platform for everyone around the world to access. So welcome to our YouTube Live. Very excited. You know some of the players here, like myself and Justine, but we have Dr. Whitmore here with us today, and we're going to have Dr. Whitmore introduce herself in a little bit. But for those of us, for those of you that have been part of our live sessions before, you know what we love to do when we get started. We love to see where you are. So now on YouTube, can you comment? Let us know from around the country, around the world, where you are logging in from. Me personally, I'm looking out the window right now. I am logging in from fairly beautiful uh, Pennsylvania just about 30 minutes north of the city. Uh, my wife is actually on a walk right now with two of our kids so they don't come in my door while we're giving our live event. But it's a beautiful day here just outside of Philadelphia. Justine, what about you? I'm coming from St. Paul, Minnesota, and it's 60 degrees and beautiful and sunny. All right. And Dr. Whitmore, what about you? I'm coming here from Knoxville, Tennessee. We had a rough, windy night, but um, it's gorgeous right now. Okay. Well, with that said, why don't we get started? Um, Justine, would you like me to change my headset? Maybe that would work? Um, no, it's just saying lots of echoing. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not hearing it on my end. Dr. Whitmore, what about you? I am not hearing it. Um, I can hear a vague uh, murmuring every now and again, but not bad. All right. Well, let's proceed and we'll see what happens. We can always change audio as it is, but let's get started on today's event. Very excited to have you all with us today. We're going to be talking about probiotics, what's the evidence, and selection considerations. Now, let's get through a little bit of housekeeping as we normally do. First thing I want to say is I wanted to thank this biome vet for sponsoring today's Vet Girl session. It's with their generous support that we're able to provide this YouTube live event to the community, to the world. So again, thank you, this Biome Vet, for sponsoring today's Vet Girl YouTube live event. If this is your first Vet Girl event, please know that we offer a whole host of options. We have small animal, large animal, leadership, real life rounds, technician, exotic, nutrition, really so many options to get your CE webinars, podcasts, videos, blogs, all race approved. And our leadership track is also CVPM approved. So make sure you check out that information. We're happy to have you on board with us today, but we hope you join us for other events as well. We also have a Vecral forum. Our Vecral forum is a great way to post questions, clinical questions. Hey, I have a case I need some help with, or maybe you just want to vent, right? So let's get to that. And then obviously social media. You're here with us on YouTube today. You're also on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. So many options to interact with us on social media. Just make sure you're checking us out. It's a great way to learn what we're doing upcoming, what we're doing in the future, what we've done already, and some cool stuff as well. So check us out on social media. Now, this event is race pending. We've submitted it for race credit. If you're attending this live, we want to get a track of who is here. So this is what you need to do. Comment in that YouTube feed, screenshot it, and then send that screenshot in an email. Right there, the email address is on this screen. Anne Marie at VeckerlOnTheRun.com. Once it is fully race approved, we will send you an email with your CE certificate. So make sure you're doing that. If you watch this after the fact, on our website. If you're a Vecral member, you're gonna have access to a short quiz. Again, once it is race approved. Again, right now, race pending, we're working on that. But we didn't wanna delay getting this information out to you. We wanted to get it there as quickly as possible. That's why we're here today and it's race pending. So again, comment, screenshot, email Anne Marie at VecralOnTheRun.com. All right, Dr. Whitmore, they didn't come here to hear myself or Justine talk. We wanna hear from you. So I'm going to mute myself, mute Justine, drop us out of the window. And if you can give us an introduction of who you are, where you are, and take it away, we're happy to hear from you. Thanks again for being here. Gosh, thanks so much to have me. It's so wonderful with everybody sheltering in place to be um, uh, to give them some support. And can you hear me? 
Okay, great, because it just gave me a thing that said I was I was muted, so I was a little worried there. Um, but it's so great to be able to give people something to uh, to listen to and to learn about while we're all sheltering in place. I'm doing it at home myself with some kids, and it's certainly quite an adventure. So about me, I'm faculty at the University of Tennessee, and um, I think it's important to share with you before we get started that I do have active research grants and have received speaker honoraria from Nutramax Laboratories and and also Viswayom Vet, and that's important because they are both makers of probiotics, which is where my research is. I have some other grants, but they're not particularly relevant or relevant at all to our talk. So what I'd like to do is probiotics are so hot right now, and people are so into them, but it's kind of one of those things people get really into, and they may not necessarily even know what it is. So I'd like to take a few minutes, and we'll start by talking about nomenclature, and then uh, move through regulatory considerations pretty quickly, and then um, selection considerations. But before we did that, I wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about why me? How did I get into this area? So about eight years ago, I started to get a lot of calls from owners and from referring vets wanting to know if they should give yogurt to um, cats receiving antibiotics, if they should be trying to put some sort of probiotic down their throat, and if so, what they should use. And the reality is there was literally no data out there whatsoever, and it felt to me like fairy dust. And so um, being always the scientist, though, I didn't feel comfortable saying no to something any more than yes. So I decided I should probably figure it out a little bit. And so with another faculty, Jennifer Stokes, at um, the University of Tennessee, we did an internally funded study. So we did this on our own um, university dime where we took cats and administered um, clindamycin because our experience has been cats love to get sick on clinda and then did that with either a placebo or pro viable. We went at the high end of the dose range because we needed to make sure we could make cats sick. We didn't expect to make them nearly as sick as we did. Um, this is a representative sample of the cat's poop, and we ended up losing four cats from the study, which is probably relevant to the fact that we found no difference in food intake, vomiting, or fecal score between the groups. Although it looked like vomiting might be less in cats administered the probiotic, that honestly made absolutely no sense to me. And so I said, well, there you go. It's fairy dust. And with that, it's time for me to just move on down the road and do research in something else because um, I already had other things I was, I was following. But then this crazy thing happened, which is that I had a kid. And so I got pregnant. And um, I had this baby who, of course, was perfect in every way. And then I went back to work. And she went to daycare. And she got an upper respiratory infection, which she had for six months. And then she got her first ear infection. And when she got her first ear infection, they said, oh my goodness, this is such a big deal um, because this is pivotal time for her development in hearing and speech. And so we started her on antibiotics. And I've taken out her, her, her beautiful, perfect face because I wouldn't want any of you to steal her as a model. Um, but what you can see is she was thrilled to receive her first dose of amoxicillin. However, she wasn't thrilled about the fact that she had resistant flora, probably, because she belongs to an internist. And so she failed amoxicillin, and then she failed it again. And then we went to Augmentin, and it was a nightmare. And then we went back to the vet, or to the, to the vet, to the pediatrician, and they said, um, she's still infected. You have to keep going. And I started crying, and I said, I can't do this. She'll have to go deaf. And they said, no, what are you talking about? And I said, she's getting too sick. We're going to kill her with the antibiotics. She can live without hearing, but I, she can't continue on this way. It's going to kill her. And they said, well, aren't, aren't you giving her cultural? I mean, you're giving her cultural. And I said, no, why would I give her that? It's just hippie fairy dust. And they said, no, really, give her some cultural. And, um, and I said, well... All right, and so I had her daycare put Culturel into her first bottle after every dose of antibiotics, and it was like the hand of God came out of the sky and grabbed us and lifted us out of the abyss. And I said, oh, maybe probiotics aren't all fairy dust. And so I decided I should probably look a little closer. And so um, when I did, the first thing I ran into is that there's a lot of words that all sound the same. So probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics, to me, it feels like alphabet soup. So what are they? Well, a probiotic 
is something that's been defined by the World Health Organization as um, being microorganisms, alive microorganisms, that when administered in adequate quantities confer a health benefit on the host. And over time, we've learned this appears to be because it's shifting the host's microbiome and metabolome. So we shift their gut back to a more healthy state where their gut's making all of the things they need to, to do well and to control other parts of the body. Prebiotics are usually fermentable fibers or carbohydrates, and they are substrates that promote growth of microorganisms that confer a health benefit. So these are fuel for good bacteria, and they may be fuel because of their fuel just for the bacteria, or they may um, be causing fermentation by certain colonic bacteria to produce energy for colonocytes, encourage their growth. They regulate intestinal motility, which is why they're so hot for people with IBS. Um, they also decrease inflammation and permeability. It's just the bomb. So you can take a prebiotic and a probiotic, and then if you put them together, you get a synbiotic. So a synbiotic is just simply combining the two things together in one package. Now, when we think of what, what we're going to provide or prescribe to our uh, patients in order to make sure we're doing the best for them, the first thing you have to remember is that probiotics and prebiotics are supplements, not drugs. And that means they have minimal regulatory scrutiny. Most of the regulation is entirely on whether they label is um, masquerading as a drug, so they can't make any health claims. But it doesn't necessarily correlate with whether the product is safe or efficacious. And in fact, less than a third of probiotics, commercially available probiotics, have been found to meet quality testing standards, which means less, and by that, we just mean contain the bacteria it says on the label in the quantity that it says on the label. Additionally, there are other problems. So some companies that spend the money to do a probiotic that's really stable, um, that's expensive. And so they do that in order to make sure that the probiotic's alive when it makes it to, um, to the end user into your patient. But other probiotics um, companies, they may not go to those lengths. And so instead what they do is they just vastly increase the quantity of bacteria in the product in hopes that a few of them will be left by the time it gets to the patient. And this is a problem because that means that you have a massive amount of dead bacteria and those dead bacteria are not, you know, just protein that can be used. They actually are pro-inflammatory. So they are doing the opposite of what you would want from the product. And finally, we can have issues of some probiotics um, have been contaminated with non-beneficial species. And in fact, uh, a small girl, a, a neonatal girl died actually from contamination that was in her probiotic product. And for that reason, it is essential if I am looking at treating my patients that I make sure that I'm using a probiotic regularly tested for both content and viability. Because it's not just a matter of maybe I'll get a placebo effect if it doesn't work. It's a matter of I got to make sure that we do no harm. So those are my regulatory concerns. So once I've set that aside and I say, okay, I'm only looking at products that I know are really good, where the manufacturers do really good work, which basically means something you're scripting from your clinic, um, then I've got some other things I need to think about. So the first thing I need to think about is how many species do I need and how many colony forming units? So there are products that are single strain and a classic example is Fortiflora which contains a solitary Enterococcus species, and it is in quantities of 100 million colony forming units per dose or per sachet. And that is, so that's gonna be single strain, and actually, although 100 million sounds like a lot, it's actually pretty much the smallest we have around in our veterinary formulations. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have high potency VSL3 and high potency visbiome, and they contain a lot of strains or a lot of species and contain 450 bil billion colony forming units per dose. So 100 million up to 450 billion colony forming units or even higher is a big difference. And as we've come along with our literature, we know that for some diseases, more bacteria and more species is key to getting a good response. The other thing to keep in mind is that just because you've got um, 
the same species of bacteria in two product, it doesn't mean they're the same. So they may not be the same strain and the strains may not be of the same equivalent. So just as Justine and I are both human women, um, no one would argue that we are identical or that we would be expected to be equally good at the same things. And so we need to make sure we're looking at the exact right bacteria and that not only is it the right strain, but has it been grown in the right way and has it been put in a safe little bubble in the right way to keep it effective. And that has been emphasized by um, the difference between VSL3 and now VisBiome. So the Dr. Um, Claude de Simon, who invented the, the formulation of VSL3, he did not elect to renew the patent for the original company and instead started a new company called VisBiome. So the original product, they can still use all of the same bacterial strains and they can still put in the exact same quantity, but they can't use any of the things that he came up with to make sure those bacteria are doing things the same way. And so um, what we can see here is this is a principal component analysis, which is looking at metabolites. So the things that the bacteria produce and saying, if I look at the metabolite profile, can I tell who is who? And what we can see is on the left, we've got a big grouping of, of blobs together. And those guys all are very, very similar. So they're producing the exact same results or they have the same metabolites. And um, on that, in that group on the left, what we're looking at is that is old VSL. So VSL prior to the expiration of the license and new VisBiome. And you can see that they cluster very tightly together. And that's because they're made the same way and they've been grown in the same loving home, basically. And so they, they work the same. But what we can see is on the right side is there's some other row groupings that are just far out in left field. And that's actually new VSL or the current VSL. And so what that means is when I look at the literature and I see that VSL funded a study five years ago that showed a major benefit for inflammatory bowel disease, I need to get, to get that benefit. I'm going to have to use VisBiome because it's been grown the right way. So long story short, gee, it's great, really it is, but maybe not like grandma made. So the other things I need to think about are, do I have a product that's inherently antibiotic resistance? So inherent antibiotic resistance might make it be a better choice for an animal who's receiving antibiotics because you're not going to take this product and then you just put it right in there with the antibiotics and they kill each other. Um, and when we think of that, we know that enterococcus species and some bifidobacteriums, like we can see in Fortiflora or uh, Prostora, may it rest in peace, can have inherent antibiotic resistance. That, that can be a benefit. Um, it also can be a limitation um, because you can have issues of conference of resistance potentially to the host. So I might pick something with antibiotic resistance for administration to a patient who's receiving antibiotics, or I might decide to give them a different type of probiotic, like Saccharomyces, which is what's in my sequin, which is yeast, and because yeast are not going to be susceptible to antibiotics. And so that is going to be another approach that I can take in that patient. Um, if I know they need to or probably will be receiving antibiotics. I do, when I'm thinking about the yeast, have to think about one other thing, which is host immunocompetence. Because if a person has a very poor immune system or an animal, um, then and they contract an infection from the probiotic, then that can be a crisis. And so there are case reports of Saccharomyces causing systemic fungemia in highly immunosuppressed people, like advanced AIDS patients. And so I'm going to be thinking about that. Um, certainly the same could happen with a bacterial probiotic under those circumstances, but it's a bit easier to clear those infections than it is if they get a yeast fungemia. I'm going to think about do I want a probiotic or do I want a synbiotic? So do I want prebiotics included? And things that are going to make me think about wanting prebiotics are going to be um, different types of gut disease where I am going to want to help heal the colon directly by giving it extra food um, or ensure that the colon moves to a less gappy state. So I want to tighten up those tight junctions and make sure I don't have bacterial translocation going on and on. And so a symbiotic might be a great choice. And then I'm going to turn my eye to, is this a case where I can use flavorings as a blessing? So can I use 
flavorants to make it that the animal thinks they're getting a treat, not a medication. And at the same time, these supplemental ingredients, so like the Forte paste has got some stool forming agents in it. The same is true for Procolin Advance. And so this can be really a game changer if you've got an owner with an animal with like self-limiting diarrhea and their new couch sheltering at home from a pandemic. We want to stop it as fast as as possible. And so then I'm going to be looking at something that's got some of these supplements in them. But I do need to keep in mind that all flavorants are not created equal and flavorants can equally be a curse. And the way that this comes into play is that products like Forte, um, like the paste or uh, the Advita contain artificial meat flavorants that's not made of any meat at all. So there's no meat protein, but somehow it still tastes like leather. In contrast, Fortiflora and Advita, also flavored, also something animals often like to eat, um, contain actual animal proteins. And these proteins then can be a danger if you have an animal with gut disease, like PLE. And a great example of that is this dog. This is Dina, and she is one of my favorite patients ever. And Dina had protein losing enteropathy. And when she came to see me, she was in really deep trouble. And we were able to get her in remission. And we got her into a really good place, normal albumin, pretty much off of medication just on her special diet and then she had a bout of a self-limiting gastroenteritis and the vet did totally the right thing in scripting her a probiotic but they didn't realize that the one that they scripted her contained animal proteins and it actually blew her out of remission and she had to come back in in crisis for us to re-regulate. So I have to think in mind about things like that when I'm making my decision. Not is it a probiotic, but which is the safe one for my patient who's on a novel protein or on a hydrolyzed diet? And then if I can't give them something flavored, how am I going to give it to them? Do I need to pill them, as is true with something like Azadil, which you're not supposed to break those capsules because those tiny little anaerobic bacteria, they go, ah! as you cut the capsule open, right? Or is it something like ProViable Forte where it's a breakable capsule or VisBiome comes in and, and VisBiome Vet, its capsules are breakable and they also have a sachet you can just mix into canned food. And then the animal doesn't know they're getting a medication. And for me, that's always a win, always. I want to make sure I'm really supporting that bond. Um, it's just the trade-offs. So those are going to be a lot of the big things I'm thinking about. And the last one is storage. So I need to make sure that my product has got the right storage for it and also all of the way along the supply chain. So um, products like uh, Visbiome, the way that it's stabilized to do the magic that it really can do is that it needs to be kept refrigerated. And so it is shipped to your clinic or if you have the owner get it and ship directly to their house, it's shipped in, with a, on ice, on dry ice or a cold pack with a card in it that has an indicator on it to say if it varied out of that temperature. So you know what you get alive. The other products generally are all stored at room temperature, which is fine. But what I run into is that owners want to go and say, oh, well, I found it on Amazon for half the price. Well, you found it on Amazon for half the price because nobody can use it because the truck sat out in the sun on a highway in Topeka, Kansas during summer for two days and killed every single thing, that uh, little drop of bacteria in there. And so if I'm going to have someone use a probiotic, I want to know that it's come directly from my clinic or directly from the manufacturer so I know that it's arriving alive. Otherwise, I'm making things worse. Long story short, all that babble, what that means is that when I get asked this question, which I guess asked all the time, what is your first line choice for a probiotic? What probiotic do I need to use, Dr. Whittemore? What's the right answer? Um, and there's all of these na names up here. You can see that at least two of them are companies from whom I have research funding. The answer is not going to be you should use this or there is one. The answer is it depends. So in order to, just as the answer of what's the right antibiotic varies based on disease and based on patient, what is the right probiotic is going to vary based on disease and based on patient. And so I really have to go back and look at the evidence to the best of my ability to make that decision. Now we don't have 
anywhere near enough time for me to talk to you about all the amazing things that probiotics can help with. Um, it's incredible and I'm hopeful I'll get back to chat with you about that another time. But I did want to take you back to my story. And if you will recall, when we left off, um, I had walked away from my research thinking that probiotics were fairy dust for management of gut disease induced by antibiotics. But then my daughter's experience made me question, could it really be a game changer? And so this is at the point where I actually first started having research funding in this area. I went to Nutramax and I said, hey, I did this study with your product and I didn't find a difference, but it wasn't really a realistic environment because no sane person would ever give a cat 150 milligrams of clindamycin a day. That's completely cracked in the head. And um, I want to do this study again and do it right. And they agreed to support me. And in fact, we have done multiple studies now because the results of the first one were so exciting. And what we found was that administration of ProViable Forte one hour after antibiotics massively decreased gas, uh, adverse effects of clindamycin in cats when the clindamycin was at a clinically relevant dose. It also led to major changes in the microbiome and the metabolome. And that is really, really exciting for me. So I said, well, hey, if we can make a big difference in cats and we can see those changes as many as six hundred days after discontinuing the product. I wonder about dogs. And so um, we looked at it again in dogs. And in dogs, what we found was very similar stuff. So to recap where we stand, we want to administer the probiotics one to two hours after antibiotics. And that's going to help with decreasing both clinical adverse effects and alterations in the microbiome and metabolome to protect against cumulative effects. And those microbiome metabolome um, effects are really, really important. It isn't just, uh, you know, fancy uh, science talk when people start throwing those words around. We know that those effects on the microbiome metabolome are where some of the linkages come in people between associations between antibiotic exposure and cancer or antibiotic exposure and obesity or asthma or inflammatory bowel disease or IBS or Crohn's disease or the list goes on and on and on and so anything we can do to ameliorate those is going to be a game changer. The other thing that was really interesting and cool in our study with cats is we discovered that six weeks after cats that got clindamycin alone like with the placebo six weeks afterwards they still had uh, six of the eight cats still had GI signs from the clindamycin and they cured when they were administered probiotics. So the game changer for me there is if I have an animal that presents with chronic enteropathy and they have a past history of antibiotic use, I might cut to doing a probiotic trial before I look at giving them um, a novel protein trial or a hydrolyzed diet or do ultrasound or spend $800. And a lot of times I can be the hero with just giving them a probiotic. As I mentioned before, I looked at the uh, dogs next, and so what we did is we looked at probiotics for preventing GI signs in dogs administered Batril metronidazole, and, and what I can tell you is it turns out Batril metro makes them really sick, makes dogs really, really sick, sicker than I ever knew, and probiotics administered one hour after each dose helps. And um, this June, we'll be presenting this, the, um, the, the middle one is an abstract, we'll be presenting at ACDM, showing that it also is associated with pretty major changes in the microbiome and metabolome. And I know you're, you're like, well, that's all that Forte stuff. Where did VisBiome come in? Well, this one's coming up next. So we're going to look at the impact of VisBiome Vet uh, versus Omeprazole for presenting preventing GI bleeding in dogs given steroids, because I've pretty compellingly proven that steroids are causing massive gastric bleeding. And um, I have faith, based on some literature and people, that maybe we can we can prevent that with probiotics. So we're going to see if we can do that and, and make a game changer there. So um, that's just sort of a, the tip of the iceberg, but I wanted to give you something, an indication, an everyday indication, which is antibiotic usage, to get you started. Long story short, evidence-based approach is essential. One size does not fit all. 
there are studies, there's good data to support proven efficacy for differing probiotic products for treating different types of acute and chronic gut disease in both cats and dogs. So self-limiting gastroenteritis, inflammatory bowel disease, megacolon, oh my gosh, megacolon, CKD, anxiety, atopy, um, there's just the list goes on and on. But you have to be mindful of flavorants. You have to look at your patient and consider all of the important factors. So I'm going to look at the science and then I'm going to be mindful of flavorings. And then I also need to remember if there isn't science, I'm not going to turn to my magic eight ball to answer the questions. Instead, I'm going to say no matter what, I'm going to start with a high quality product with regular testing and optimal storage to maximize benefit. Well, it's a bit of a whirlwind and I hope I have it like I've been told it's a little bit like me talking from a fire hose or drinking from a fire hose when I talk about probiotics. Um, I'm, I'm gating myself and I hope I get to come back to you to talk about some of those cool indications. But, um, but for now, I just want to say thanks to VizBiome Vet. This is me sheltering at home in place with my three nut job dogs, one of whom is on probiotics. And, um, and I want to thank you guys for having me here and I'm going to turn it back to Garrett. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, love, Justine. Yeah, love seeing so many people on. Uh, we've had over 400 people on live, and we really appreciate all of you guys taking our time to join us today. I know you're all really busy uh, being in clinics, sheltering, being essential. And I will also say that we wanted to give a huge shout out to VizBiome Vet. So thank you so much again for the sponsorship. A couple of great questions. Now, um, Dr. Whitmore, I know that you answered and said yes. There are so many diseases as we can see this oh with. Yeah. I was shocked when I used probiotics on my own cat for vomiting, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's not even labeled for, and it worked fantastic. But it's any, amazing. Any idea for short bowel syndrome in dogs? We often see that in the ER when, you know, they have a massive resection in astromosis. Right. That's a really good question. There isn't any data to help answer that question in animals, but we do know that probiotics have, have got strong efficacy for management of IBS type syndrome, both both diarrhea syndrome and constipation syndrome in people, so both the too fast and too slow. Um, so they d are able to regulate the, um, the transit time. And so I think there's definitely potential for there to be benefit there. I think that would definitely be a situation where I want to use a symbiotic so that I am having my best benefit for normalizing motility and decreasing um, uh, leakiness of the tight junctions. So another question, should we be automatically sending home cats and dogs with probiotics with any type of antimicrobial therapy or is it just with clindamycin, just with enrofloxacin? Well, we don't know. We don't know the answer for animals. What I can tell you is that there is a different study that looked at clavamox in cats and Fortiflora, and they did not find that Fortiflora prevented gastrointestinal signs in cats. Uh, due to clavamox, but they administered the probiotic two hours before antibiotics instead of administering it after. And I think that's really the game changer. In people, the worst players are broad spectrum um, antibiotics, which is why we don't see such severe gastrointestinal signs with maybe, ju maybe just metronidazole. But when you add in the Batril, it's a game changer. Um, any antibiotic, though, is causing massive derangements in the microbiome. In people, they found five days of just five days of, of amoxicillin is enough to completely derange your microbiome for at least four years at least and so any more yes my answer is we're giving an antibiotic and 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 this has been shown with injectable antibiotics too there's a study looking at injectable lincomycin in dogs and they found probiotics helped so anytime i'm providing antibiotics um, i'm looking at probiotics um one to two hours after each dose and I want to do, although I couldn't do it in my studies, um, what I would do in a clinical case is continue it as they do in people for four to six weeks after discontinuation of antibiotics, which is why I have a dog on probiotics right now. It's so interesting. Um, just my personality, Myers-Briggs, I don't truly always try new things until it happens in my mm -hmm. own dog or cat and self. Yes. And I will also attest with you, yes, when I got one or two doses of amoxicillin clavulanic acid for a bad cat bite, whew, 
It was oh a gosh. great weight loss program. <laughs> it's and it's terrible. And the thing is, that's causing those. We know, for example, that antibiotic so antibiotic usage is tied to development of chronic enteropathy in people. Well, there's actually also an association with dogs get, that had parvovirus. And it's believed that the reason pyrovirosis predisposes dogs to chronic enteropathy is because of the antibiotics that they often receive. Same has been seen with um, what used to be called HGE and is now acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. Um, but so, I mean, it is such a game changer to look at probiotics for all of those sort of acute and, and chronic gut diseases. And it's something that I, uh, I am such a skeptic. It's like, if I don't have the science, it does it isn't real and um and i have been really sold by the science both that we've done um which you don't have to trust me now i want to point this out i have made it um i've made a very strong mission that everybody should be able to know what i know and so i only publish things where i have the control over it um i.e if i'm first or mentoring author i only publish open access which means every single one of those studies you saw you, no matter who you are, whether you're an owner, whether you are a veterinarian in um, the remote of, of, of Siberia, you can access that for free. Um, all you got to have is an internet connection. We know you've got that because you're here with us now. Fantastic. I'm also going to say we need you internists to stop renaming everything. It's always going to be HGE oh, I know. for me too. I know. It's, it's always HGE for me too. It's kind of, I talk about it, I'm like, you know, it, what formerly used to be HG, it's sort of the um, the prince formerly known as the artist, formerly yeah. known as prince. It's kind of exactly. like that. But exactly. It's All challenge. right. Another question. You mentioned using yeah. probiotics with parvovirus infection. Are there yes. any age specifications where it would be contraindicated to use a probiotic? Um, and another great question that I'm seeing is when we're yeah. treating them with antimicrobial therapy, once the clinical signs resolve, how long do we continue the probiotic for? Right, and the it's so cool. So we know, so um, so with the parvo thing, like my hat, like um, there's this paper which unfortunately is not open access, but was published looking at at what is now Visbiome for parvovirus, and they found it it massively shortened the severity of illness. So, so the difference in severity of illness by day three was dramatic between dogs. Let me get my hands in the, there we go. Uh, <laughs> by day three of the, of, of treatment by day five, you, it was unbelievable. And it actually, there was a non-statistically significant, but a noticeable difference in mortality. Um, and so what they did, I'm like, what, are you insane? How are you supposed to give a probiotic to a puppy that's vomiting its head off and has no white cells? That seems crazy, um, but it works. And what they did is they just took it, uh, the, the Visbiome, and they suspended it in a syringe of water and just syringed it in water. And, um, and it was a real, um, really, it's a game changer. So I really draw, do support that. Um, as far as how long do you go with probiotics, uh, after antibiotics, we don't know, um, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't just do them when they're symptomatic because the point is not to control their current clinical signs and leave something brewing. The point is to do our best to protect them from signs in the future. And that's where the arbitrary guideline I've come up with in people is four to six weeks after discontinuation of antibiotics. Wonderful. The other thing is don't give them antibiotics. If, if, if only 10 people who watch this, um, this, uh, event, uh, listen to me, it will have been worth it to me if you will put down the antibiotics when they have self-limiting gastroenteritis. Do not give them antibiotics. Amen. Do not give them metro. <laughs> Amen. Uh, give them a probiotic. And I, oh, all the time I hear, well, but owners will just go and get it from the other vet. Well, you know what? Owners might go get it from the other vet if you don't talk to them a little bit about it. But when you say, hey, I can give you something that is going to take twice as long to work and increases the risk in people of cancer, obesity, and asthma, but you've heard of it, or... I can give something that is safe and will cut the duration of signs by half compared to antibiotics. Nobody's really pushing for the antibiotics anymore. 
And compliance so. wise, uh, I oh stopped gosh. using metronidazole for diarrhea years ago oh, yeah. because they're never going to get, first of all, it's so bitter, but they're never going to get oh, more nice. than a couple of days worth. And yeah. we're really causing a lot of antimicrobial resistance. So yeah, uh, please stop terrible. doing that. I totally agree with you. Really important. All right. Let's do one more question. And I think this is a really important one because a lot of times our staff are saying, oh, just give one or two tablespoons of canned pumpkin. Right. Who's saying? this where's the evidence and why are we saying pumpkin what should we be strategizing and right right so canned pumpkin is actually the bomb um because it's a prebiotic and so that's where it came from is that it is a prebiotic but um there's there's some caveats right is that um that it isn't the one size fits all solution and actually there was a, a really shocking study they did where they looked at uh, five different prebiotics and they looked at the impact on intestinal um, permeability and two of them greatly improved or decreased intestinal permeability and one of them uh, created a pro-inflammatory state and a leaky gut syndrome and so all prebiotics are not going to be created equal if I'm looking at a prebiotic they want to use you know, if I'm, I'm looking at a dog that's just having some um, constipation syndrome and they want to get some canned pumpkin, as long as the owner understands that's not canned pumpkin pie filling, we've all been there, um, then that's okay. But if I'm looking at, I really want to treat a dog for dysbiosis, I want to treat a dog that's got primary gut disease, I've got a cat with megacolon, that's not what I want to do. I want to be looking at that this is a serious uh, they're labeled as supplements, but to me, this is a serious therapeutic weapon in our arsenal, and I'm going to either be looking at a high-quality uh, probiotic or I'm going to be looking at a symbiotic. All right. So, right. Just wanted to um, remind everyone, you can get CE for half an hour once this is race approved. So we'll email you in a few weeks. It's only for the live CE, unless you're a Vecral Elite member. And so make sure to take a screenshot of you watching this with comments and email it directly to Anne Marie at BeckerlOnTheRun.com. Uh, that email address is in the comments below. And again, we just want to thank you so much, Dr. Whitmore. That was an amazing, amazing lecture incredible feedback that we're getting right now. And again, just wanted to give a huge shout out uh, for all of you guys for attending. We know everyone's really busy and doesn't have time to get CE. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, we really appreciate, you know, technically we're considered essential workers and we don't always feel that way. So we know everyone's putting themselves at exposure, uh, seeing clients curbside wise. Thank you for everything that you guys do uh, from CSR to vet assistants to vet students who uh, aren't in clinics or are learning online to our veterinary nurses to our veterinary staff. So our veterinarians, everyone, thank you so much. And a huge shout out to VizBiome Vet for being able to provide this Vet Girl YouTube live event. Again, if you guys like it, please make sure to share this. It'll be on the internet forever in case your uh, colleagues couldn't watch it. So make sure to direct them directly to that. And we will be sending a CE certificate in a couple of weeks. And with that, everyone, please stay safe. And again, thank you so much for attending today.